You're watching Greater Brockton, a special edition today, um, a half an hour show. Normally we're here for nine or 18 minutes. We're gonna be here for 30 because the guest that I have today is a, a, a fairly familiar face. I had him a few years back. Uh, I'm gonna call him, even though it's former, Lieutenant Colonel retired, James Zumwalt. Welcome back, Jim. Thank you very much. Great to be back. Nice to see you. You're, uh, you're uh, back here in Massachusetts uh, visiting our, our, our wonderful Stonehill College over in Northeastern uh, for your second tour of duty. Is that correct? That's right. And uh, I'll be speaking this evening at, uh, at Stonehill about uh, my, my first book on, on the Vietnam War. Okay. And that first book, which is called, um, I have it here, it's... Bear, bear. Bear Bare Feet, Iron Will. Bare Feet, Iron Will, which I understand now isn't just in English. You you took the book and translated it into into Vietnamese. Well, actually, the a Vietnamese publisher contacted me about uh, getting the rights to, to translate it into Vietnamese and, and publish it there. The, uh, uh, the the focus of the of the book, just so your listeners understand, is that. Uh, um, the the book is unique in that it, it looks at the war from the enemy side of the battlefield. I, I made over 50 trips back to Vietnam after the war to uh, interview a couple of hundred of their veterans. Uh, everybody from uh, from General Jap, who commanded the NVA Army, to uh, General uh, uh, Tron, who commanded the Viet Cong forces. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, it was about 10 years of research before I, I finally uh, published the book in 2009. Now, I understand it was a bestseller over in Vietnam, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, it was. It uh, was a bestseller there. The Vietnamese publisher told me, he said, uh, when I get through with you, you will be a rock star. But he failed to tell me that all my fans would be in their 60s and 70s. So. Well, <laughs> not, not bad, not bad. Um, so let me ask you a question. You're, you're, you're back to promote it again and to talk about it. Why is it important to have learned from the lessons of the Vietnam War and how is it relevant today? Well, in my case, what uh, initiated me to write the book, uh, I, I, I went on a journey and uh, I lost a brother uh, due to uh, Agent Orange exposure and the bitter irony for our family was that uh, it was my father who was commanding the naval forces in Vietnam and ordered the spraying of Agent Orange. Uh, Agent Orange, for those listeners that, that don't know, was a, a herbicide that was used to defoliate the, uh, uh, the riverbanks in Vietnam because the Navy was taking drastically high casualties. It, uh, if you served on one of the uh, river boats in, in Vietnam, you stood a 72% chance during a 12-month tour of being killed or wounded. And the reason for it was because of the heavy vegetation the enemy was able to set up ambushes close to the river and, and uh, initiate an ambush before the crew really had time to, to react. And uh, they would basically take their, their casualties in the, in the early minutes of, a, of an ambush. But once the defoliation occurred, the, uh, and your, some of your viewers may have seen pictures of the riverbanks after Agent Orange had been applied, but for about 100 yards back on either bank, it was totally stripped of all vegetation, and that forced the enemy to move back much farther in setting up his ambushes. The casualty rate dropped from 72% to 6%. Mm. And uh, the, uh, my father had checked with the chemical companies beforehand and was assured that there was no uh, harmful effect to humans. We now know that was, uh, uh, he was being misled on that mm -hmm. because we, uh, we found out a number of our veterans returned from that conflict and uh, years later came down with uh, numerous cancers that have now been linked to Agent Orange exposure and my brother was, was one of those. But it was, uh, it was his loss uh, that uh, really caused me to become very angry about the war and the enemy we had fought there. And uh, uh, my father, I, I think when tragedy hits, you, there's, there's uh, two ways you can react. One is to converted into positive energy and, and to, to do something useful. And my father did that by throwing himself into the Agent Orange issue. I, on the other hand, let the negative energy consume me and became very, uh, very depressed. Mm -hmm. uh, my, uh, my father in 1994 made a uh, trip over to Vietnam to see if he couldn't get the Vietnamese government to agree to do a joint study on Agent Orange. And I, uh, he asked me to go with him. Initially, I was reluctant to do so, but I, I went over with him and, and uh, uh, 
found during the course of the meetings we were having with our former adversaries, the anger was welling up inside me. And uh, something unusual happened on about the third day. I, I had a one-on-one -on -one meeting with a, uh, a medical doctor who was a, a, a general in the North Vietnamese Army. And uh, he extended his condolences for the loss of my brother. And we started talking about the war and its impact. And as we did, I noticed he got a little teary-eyed. And uh, I later learned that he too had lost a brother in the war. And I think it was that moment that I reflected on the fact was the loss of a loved one any less significant just because it occurred on the other side of the battlefield. And the answer was no, it was devastating to both of us. And uh, so that's what caused me to basically uh, make the decision that I needed to go back and hear their stories and write a book about the war from their side of the battlefield. And tell everybody about it. Let me just backtrack for a minute. Your father was Admiral, the original Elmo, yes. okay, not the Elmo in Sesame Street, <laughs> but his nickname was Bud someone. Right. And right. he was the Chief of Naval Operations, that, correct? That's correct. He, okay. he, prior to that, he commanded all the naval forces in Vietnam, 1960 to 1970, and then was uh, selected over 33 senior admirals to become uh, head of the Navy, Chief of Naval Operations, and served in that capacity from 1970 to 74. And youngest, if I remember correctly? He, he, at age 49, he was the youngest Chief of Naval Operations in Naval history, and, and that uh, remains a record that's unbroken today. And trailblazer, reformer. I know I, I was reading one of the articles from the dedication of the ship up in Bath, Maine, that reformer, that's actually on the tombstone? That's correct. Okay. And, uh, Tell us about your dad a little bit, and then we'll get back to the book and why you're here and some of the other stuff. I want you to recollect your dad. I've heard about it. I've listened to your story. I've read about it. But obviously it comes even more from the heart from you. Well, he was a, re a remarkable man. Uh, he was my life's hero. And uh, a number of people have asked me, what was he like as a father? They, they figured that somebody who was so successful in the military had to be a bit of a martinet. But uh, uh, I, I never saw the man get angry uh, in my lifetime, and God knows I gave him reasons to get angry. Uh, but uh, he, uh, he, he set such an example, I think, for my brother uh, and me both that uh, it was almost by osmosis that we, we realized that we wanted to serve our country. You know, my, my father never sat us down and said, you have an obligation to do this. We, we came to that conclusion on our own. Uh, but he was... He was definitely, uh, uh, for both my brother and I, our, our, our life hero. And military service is deep in your family. It goes back generations. Yes, uh, we've had a tradition of military service going back to the American Revolution. Uh, Jacob Zumwalt served in the, the uh, Revolutionary War. He's now buried at Fort Zumwalt, Missouri, uh, which is just in the process of being renovated, and they're going to have a dedication ceremony for that in, in May of this year. Uh, so it'll, it'll be interesting to have uh, a Zumwalt memorialized from, uh, you know, the, the, the 1700s and later on in the year having one memorialized uh, when the new ship is commissioned uh, bearing my father's name. Tell us about the ship. Um, I unfortunately had a change of plans. I was invited and I regretted not being able to go, but from what I heard from my friend Mike Petrowski at Stonehill and other folks that went from up here, it was quite the event up in Bath, Maine. Well, to begin with, it's an, it's an amazing ship. It's a, a totally new class of warship, and it's a destroyer, but uh, looks absolutely nothing uh, like any of the destroyers that have preceded it. it first of all, it's about 60% larger than uh, the regular destroyer, and when you first see it, you think it's, it's a submarine rather than a destroyer because uh, there, uh, you, you see none of the high profiles like radars, uh, uh, gun mounts, things of that nature. You, you do have gun mounts, but the barrels retract into the, uh, into the mount so that it uh, reduces the, the radar profile. It has uh, surface-to-air missile launchers and surface-to-surface -surface missile launchers, but those are, are all embedded on the sides of the ship and, again, uh, are, used, uh, are, are done to avoid contributing to the, uh, the radar profile. Even the bow of the ship is unique. Uh, the, uh, it's... Uh, a bow that uh, extends, if, if, if people recall the Merrimack, the bow of the Merrimack uh, in Civil War days, it, uh, it's very similar to that. And the reason for that is that the normal bow cutting through the water creates a very large bow wave which contributes to the radar profile. Mm. And uh, with this uh, uh, Merrimack type uh, bow, it greatly reduces the, the bow wave. So the, it's 
and the, it incorporates the stealth technology so that on a, a radar screen, the enemy can't tell if it's a fishing boat or a, or a warship. Uh, very unique in that, in that regard. And um, it's interesting that the name of the first commanding officer of the ship is uh, Captain James Kirk. Uh, uh, you beat me so. to it on that one. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. You know, I, I, I know it's made the rounds, and it even it, it went back to the uh, fictitious yes. James Kirk. Yes, the, the media's had a field day with it. They, been saying that uh, Captain Kirk finally gets his stealth ship. So, uh, but what would your dad think of the naming of the ship in his memory? I, 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 from what I can gather, he was he was a commanding presence, but he was pretty unassuming. He he it, he, he wasn't an egomaniac he, by any standards. He, he was a very humble man, and uh, I'm I'm sure if he were alive when the decision decision was made, he would have said, "Look, there there are others who." Uh, are much more deserving of this than uh, than I am, uh, but uh, uh, you know, as as uh, his son, I uh, when I first got the news, I, I mean the the pride that that swelled through my veins, I just I just can't describe. I, I knowing the man, knowing what he had accomplished, uh, knowing what his leadership was like, knowing what he had done for the Navy, uh, I, I thought it was uh, just a, a beautiful tribute to. Uh, to his life and what he was all about. And it, you said commissioning in the future, so it, it, it was dedicated, so the next step is a commissioning? Well, there, there's, there's three major uh, steps in, in the construction of a ship. First is the keel laying, uh, when you have about 30% of the ship built. Uh, second is the christening, and uh, that's when you break the bottle of champagne over the, the bow. And, and then the third is the commissioning, when the Navy finally says, we're ready to take this ship, and uh, and they take it over uh, ownership from the shipyard. So uh, we've had two of the the three, and the uh, commissioning now will take place uh, probably in July of next year. In a warmer climate. Uh, well, year, maybe. Yeah, I, although this year uh, didn't seem like anybody escaped the. Uh, no, not at all. <laughs> not at all. So um, we'll go. I, I mean, I think that's a great tribute to your father, your family, the whole family service, and it's nice that you're able to, to see it to fruition and to experience it because, I mean, when they, I, I'm sure they don't name anything after anybody lightly. I'm yeah. sure there are all sorts of reasons for it. And, you know, he, he was a pioneer. So, and this is a pioneering ship from everything that I've been told. Oh, exactly. And my father was not only a pioneer and a reformer, he, he did a lot of things in the Navy that, that uh, I, 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 he, as he described it, he made him a long list of friends and a long list of enemies, and uh, quite frankly, he was very proud of both lists. Uh, but uh, you know, he did what he knew had to be done to shake the Navy up. Uh, when he took over as Chief of Naval Operations in 1970, reenlistment rates because of an unpopular war were uh, at an all-time low at 9 percent, and uh, that was uh, greatly burdening the Navy because it meant that rather than being able to budget for R&D, you were having to budget for bringing new people on board to train them to have mm -hmm. them do the job that the people, uh, the, the veterans were, were leaving. And uh, so he implemented uh, a number of changes in the, in the Navy that were, uh, that were uh, uh, published as what came to be known as Z-grams. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, each one of them focused on uh, improving life for the uh, the sailors. The uh, uh, just an example of, of some of them. I, having come from uh, Vietnam, my father had uh, seen how how uh, professionally his uh, sailors had performed in combat, and so he saw no reason why they shouldn't be allowed to have neatly trimmed beards and, and mustaches uh, as their civilian counterparts had. So he he authorized them to to uh, to have beards and mustaches. Uh, the, uh, one of the other things that was kind of, of uh, hurting motivation was that uh, there were things like sailors were required to, uh, if they were on ship in a port, they, uh, uh, when, they, when they went home, they would have to change out of their work uniform into civilian clothes or, or a, uh, you know, a formal military uniform, mm -hmm. go home, and then the next morning they reverse the process. They come back in their, their uniform, have to change into the work uniform, and then uh, uh, you know, continue the, the, the process. But you know, my father sent a Z-gram out that said that they could go directly from ship and, and, uh, to home and vice versa wearing their work uniform as long as they 
you made the trip directly and didn't uh, didn't stop. So, you know, a, a very simple change like that. And when you take all the changes that he made together, it had quite an impact on on morale. And in fact. Uh, by the time he retired four years later, he had uh, tripled the reenlistment rate. So uh, that, that uh, I think, was a, uh, an important indicator of how uh, he had turned the Navy around. He also changed people's minds on issues dealing with race and, and sex in the Navy. Exactly. He, he had uh, study groups that uh, uh, went out and interviewed a number of uh, minority sailors to learn what problems they were having, and a lot of them uh, you know, my father wasn't even aware of until these study groups came back and said, uh, uh, you know, these are what some of the problems are. For example, uh, some of our African-American sailors uh, couldn't find the kinds of uh, skin products that they needed mm -hmm. at the commissary and PX. And so, you know, my father quickly addressed that. But uh, his, his goal was to make the, the Navy uh, a more livable environment for, for everybody. And... Uh, all his Z-grams focused on that. And I, I think the important thing to recognize is that the last Z-gram he issued was uh, one that uh, retired all the previous ones because by that point in time, all the changes he had made had uh, taken root and were, were moving forward. Now, um, I understand that something historic is about to happen, and I guess you're at liberty to reveal that to us. I know it's gonna be talked about at Stonehill, and if I jump the gun, you can just rewind. <laughs> we can't rewind the tape because it's not a tape anymore, but we can jump back. But there's something that he would be very proud of that's upcoming. Yes, uh, uh, several months ago, I, I read where a uh, African-American African uh, woman was uh, being awarded her fourth star in the Navy. She was the first African-American woman to uh, achieve that, uh, that pay grade. And I immediately sent her an email congratulating her on it and recognizing the last name, she immediately wrote me back and said, uh, I just want you to know I gave this speech uh, two or three months earlier and wanted to send you a copy and I read through the speech and uh, in that speech she talked about some of the the difficulty she incurred in the Navy, but said that the but said that the the one person that opened all the doors for her was my father, uh, and in a number of the the Z grams that he passed to improve life for uh, for minorities. Uh, it wasn't only African Americans. For example, uh, Filipinos uh, the they had been limited for for uh, centuries uh, to uh, or decades to the. Uh, uh, performing the role of stewards uh, in the officer's mess. And my father saw absolutely no reason all the ratings shouldn't be opened up to them. And so he opened up all the ratings to them mm -hmm. as well. But he did everything in his power, and he knew he had to move on it quickly because he only had four years to do it uh, to try and, and uh, do as, as much as he could for the minorities. He, uh, he promoted the, uh, the first woman to the, uh, the rank of rear admiral, two-star billet, mm -hmm. and... Uh, uh, to, to show you my father's humor, he, uh, a picture appeared of him in the, in the newspaper uh, kissing the, uh, the admiral on the cheek. And uh, about a week later, my father got a letter from a classmate saying, uh, uh, Dear Bud, I never thought I'd live to see the day that I saw the chief of naval operations kissing an admiral. And mm. uh, my father immediately wrote him back and said, Dear friend, you must understand that nobody becomes the chief of naval operations without having kissed a lot of admirals. <laughs> oh, geez, I like it. And uh, I, I guess they're kind of lucky it's not the vice president of the United States right now because <laughs> uh, he can be a little touchy. So, um, oh, I, 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 I didn't finish up on, on your sorry. initial question. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But yeah, it's, I, what, what is her name? Uh, Michelle Howard is her name. And, okay. And she was promoted to, to four stars and then became uh, the number two, took the number two position in the Navy, the vice chief of naval operations. But uh, at, uh, at the suggestion of a good friend of mine, Mike Petrowski, he wanted to know if we could uh, give her an invitation to speak at, at Stonehill College. And so uh, uh, I made the, the offer to her and she uh, very graciously accepted. So she will be coming to speak at the university on, uh, at, at the college on September 30th. That sounds great. I can't lo I'm looking forward to that. And, you know, it, it's amazing how um, ideas from I guess one decade or one era 
take time to evolve. And but if you see something simple like what you're talking about with the skin products, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, what what's the big deal in doing that? Exactly. In that day, it was a big deal, yeah. but now it, it seems routine. So. Yeah. Um, Going back on history, we were, we were talking before the show about current events and things that are happening now. Um, you're back here again. It's not a repackaging, but it's 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 talking about the lessons learned in Vietnam. You know, from both sides of the spectrum. But how can we relate those to current events? Things that are going on right now. The world. I mean, we we heard a, a candidate already talk about the world being on fire. Okay, a three-year-old didn't react too well to that, but um, you know, we the, the world is in crisis. But how does it relate the the messages and lessons to Vietnam to current day world events? Well, it's an interesting question. I, I the lesson I learned from my uh, the ten years of going back to Vietnam and and uh, interviewing these hundreds of veterans is uh, when you boiled it down to the basic foundation, there really were there really was very little difference between what they wanted in life and what we wanted in life. You know, they, what they wanted basically was to be able to provide for a family and, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, and, you know, they, they felt that they had been invaded by, uh, by the U.S. Uh, if you take a look at Vietnam's history, a thousand years of history, every century they've had to deal with an invader and uh, every invader has ultimately been driven out. So they were committed to uh, driving us out as well. Uh, but the thing that's interesting now is that uh, Vietnam uh, recognizes that the war with the U.S. was a mistake of history and will not occur again. Uh, they, uh, they also recognize that since in every century they've been invaded by the Chinese, that it's more likely that there will be another conflict with the, with the Chinese and they're very con concerned about China. So. Uh, after having spent so many years driving America out of Vietnam, now they're they're uh, reaching out uh, to have us come back in and uh, you know maybe occupy a base there or uh, set up a base so that we basically will become a tripwire to prevent China from taking action against Vietnam. Uh, so it's uh, you know an amazing reversal of what. Uh, the 20th century, the relations between the U.S. and Vietnam were during the 20th century and, and what they are now in the 21st century. Uh, that said, there, there's, I think there is uh, this basic foundation, though, with the Vietnamese that we can build upon to, to uh, make a much closer uh, uh, relationship between the two countries. And they fear the Chinese, and we should fear them, too, because uh, with their improving economy, they are putting a lot of that money into a defense budget. And I believe within the next 10 years, they will have a, a Navy that will challenge ours. Uh, the uh, few people realize that uh, several centuries ago, China was a uh, naval superpower. And uh, somewhere along the line, they, they felt that the real threat was coming from land rather than sea, so they, they surrendered that fleet. They, uh, they have learned the lessons of history and they now know how important it is to have a, a, a navy and a, a very large navy to protect their uh, logistics and, and uh, supply lines and so forth. So uh, we, we are going to have some serious confrontations with the, with the Chinese uh, in, the, in the years ahead. I heard you say they've learned. Do you think we've learned? Do you think this country has learned or let me ask, maybe turn it a little bit has the political gridlock in Washington between the polarization of the the two parties or the three parties or whatever we have going on down there is is that hurting the military and maybe we've learned the lessons but are we repeating them I, I seriously doubt that we've we've learned the lessons um, you know one of the lessons that I learned in doing my research uh, was something that was taught to us 2,500 years ago by the Chinese military strategist Sun Tzu, and he wrote a book entitled The Art of War, in which he enunciated various principles of war that one should master before engaging an enemy. And one of those is you never engage an enemy on the battlefield unless you know that enemy first. And we didn't know the enemy we fought in Vietnam and suffered the consequences of that. You know, we had this this perception that is a superpower uh, and, and confronting a, a third world power that uh, we would be able to easily take them on and defeat them. But 
what we didn't understand was their creativity and uh, their their persistence and uh, uh, and throwing what they considered uh, an invader out of their country. Um, and, and I see that happening again today. We, we don't understand the threat that we're facing uh, with uh, these organizations like ISIS and Al-Qaeda and, and uh, Boko Haram. And uh, you know, one of the things that, that helped us in the Cold War, I believe it was back in the 50s or 60s, there was a famous National Security Council resolution, uh, Resolution 68 as I recall, but it basically formalized a policy on what needed to be done to defeat uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, and that, that policy was put together with some of the best minds uh, in the United States at that point in time, and it became the framework with, uh, within which every subsequent uh, administration operated. And it was one of basically boiled down to containment of the, uh, of the Soviet threat which we, we were effectively did until the Soviet Union collapsed in, uh, in 1991. I see no similar effort that's been made to address the, uh, the, the threat we're dealing with now with these uh, extremist organizations. And uh, we, we need to understand what that threat is and that it is a very serious threat. It, uh, you know, my, as far as the prior, priority of threats go, in, in my mind, it's, it's these extremist organizations first, and, and, and China is on a back burner. We're going to have to deal with them uh, later rather than sooner. Now, is, uh, we've got about three minutes left, so I want to make sure you can get anything out that I haven't asked you about that you want to communicate to our viewers. Uh, why don't I do that first, okay. just in case? Well, I would like to brag about my son, uh, my uh, son who continued the, uh, the family legacy of military service, and uh, he, uh, he embarrassed me by not going Marine Corps, he went Navy instead, mm -hmm. but uh, he uh, became a EOD technician, explosive ordnance disposal, one of the uh, specialties that has the highest casualty rate in, uh, in the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. But uh, he had two tours in Iraq and uh, defused over 180 roadside bombs. and. Uh, I don't think I ever prayed so hard as I did while he was over there, and and uh, you know God was good to us. Uh, returned him uh, in peace, in, in one piece, and uh, mm -hmm. he now is uh, has gotten out of the service and is working on Capitol Hill as a military legislative assistant. He he also became the the fourth uh, generation of the family to be awarded the Bronze Star. So that's that's phenomenal. And he's in, uh, he's another warrior in another right because he's walking the halls of Congress, correct? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, Jim, what? How would people get in touch with you if they want to know more information? I know you have a website, and I know you have other publications, and you're in the process of doing more. Right. I uh, I do have a website, and if they go to www.jamesgzumwalt.com. That'll, uh, uh, that's all together, no dots in between. That'll take them directly to the website and they can, they can correspond with me that way. Um, I've, uh, I've written three books now after the, the book on the Vietnam War. I, I wrote uh, a book about North Korea and the threat we face there. And, and um, then the third book I wrote was on, uh, entitled The Doomsday Clock uh, about Iran and uh, the threat we're facing there. I'm very concerned about this agreement that uh, President Obama is trying to uh, negotiate with the Iranians and the fact that it will not prevent them from getting the, the nuclear uh, bomb, but pave the a, path. We'll have to do a whole nother show about yeah. that. So <laughs> just, just final thoughts, because they gave me the, the one minute cue. Oh. Well, uh, we're li living in very dangerous and challenging times. And uh, I would hope that uh, your viewers would take the opportunity to understand more about the threat we're facing. And the best way to do that is to do what I did, was to start reading the Quran and understand exactly what the Quran uh, is about and why we need to be concerned about uh, the threat of Islamist extremists. I could have done another half an hour. Thank you <laughs> very much, Jim. I Thank appreciate you. it. Uh, you're watching Greater Brockton. Uh, Mark Lindy, your host. Stay tuned for more important people, events, and places in Greater Brockton and throughout the world.